Um, fine. Okay. Well, um, hello to those of us that have joined us over Skype. Um, I'm Rick Hepworth. I'm um, an MVP. Oh, sorry, well, let me do that. Um, I'm an MVP for Microsoft Azure, which basically means I get it indoctrinated to pronounce it badly. Um, and here at Black Marble, I'm the IT director, and I do quite a lot of sort of cloud adoption consultancy. With me, sat next to me, is uh, Richard Fennell. I'll let him introduce himself. Hello, uh, I'm the engineering here, engineering director here at Black Marble. Uh, I spend most of my time looking at all of the tooling and the stuff that we use to help deliver software. And I'm an MVP for Microsoft's ALM DevOps stack. So. Um, here at Black Marble, we, we do quite a lot of, of different and interesting uh, projects. So we've we've uh, last year we were DevOps Partner of the Year for Microsoft, and that was mainly on the on the back of Richard's hard work. And um, we've also uh, won awards previous year for best uh, Windows application, Windows developers. So um, we we called this session "Living the Dream" because. We, we, we really do have to practice what we preach here at Black Marble. We have to um, be concerned about the, the quality of our coding, the quality of our processes. And because there's no such thing really as a normal Black Marble project, everyone is different, that means we get to, to use a whole range of different technologies. So what we thought we'd do today is, is a bit of a game of two halves. So I'm going to talk a little bit about um, where DevOps has, has come from, and then I'm going to talk about infrastructure as code using Azure resource templates. Then I'm going to hand over to Richard, who's going to talk about some of the changes we've made to the way that we, we um, write our code and, and manage configurations to allow us to do automated build and automated deployment, and he'll show you um, using Visual Studio Team Services to um, create those build and deployment pipelines. So everything that we we talk about and show today, whilst yes, we're using a, a demo project, if you like, um, it's all stuff that we, we do day to day, um, both for ourselves and for our customers. Um, I should say that Rich and I sat next to each other. We're, we're talking through my machine and using it for presentations, but if you want to ask questions in the chat channel, I'm, I'm sure Richard will do his usual appalling typing and try and answer them. Um, so. Where to start? So, so everybody now starts to hear DevOps coming up in, in, in conversations. Um, but if you start looking at DevOps, nobody really, until you start reading about it and really getting into it, everybody thinks of DevOps as being a different thing. Um, they're all looking at different bits of the elephant, if you like, and, and, and seeing slightly different pictures. Fundamentally, what we're starting to see now is organizations need to deploy their applications. And when we start talking about applications in this sense, we're not talking about necessarily an app on a mobile phone. We're talking about large scale enterprise apps where we've got databases and web services and we might have some integration and we've got some clients everywhere. And we need to be able to update the code and fix faults and add features and push that out with I think probably the most important point is the minimum amount of business risk. And what people have found over time is the way to reduce business risk is to reduce the number of individual changes in a given release. And you end up with a situation where you need to deploy frequent releases with small numbers of changes in with a very high degree of reliability and repeatability. So I know one of the, the companies that Richard works with, they, they, they reckon that um, the servers in their environments, they last no longer than nine hours. They don't patch them, they just shoot them, throw them away and, and, and throw another one out. And um, here at Black Marble, we, we, because of the people we do development work for, um, we need to fold other things than just reliability and repeatability into the process. We also need to think about security and making sure we're compliant with any uh, legal frameworks, government frameworks, that kind of stuff. So as, as a company, we create solutions for the police force. 
which means we need to be really careful about the, the code that we're writing and we need to be very careful that um, we don't introduce any security holes in that. And um, that process these days is, is starting to be called rugged DevOps. Got to love it. Real devs wear plaid and all that. Um, and when we start talking about DevOps, you'll come across a couple of terms banded around shift left and shift right. So in the olden days, we, we had um, developers who were quiet and sat in darkened rooms and didn't talk to people. Um, and we had IT pros who were the, the customer facing gregarious side of the IT community. Richard's a dev, I'm an IT pro. And what always used to happen was the devs would write the code and they'd make sure it compiled on their machine and then throw it at me, the IT pro, and go, catch, install, off we go. And DevOps really fundamentally is about breaking down that wall and trying to build one unified team. But it's not just about people. It's about helping the IT guys gather the telemetry to see what applications are doing when they're running and feed enough information back to developers to clearly articulate when there's a problem and what that problem might be. And from the dev side, it's about putting in place robust tooling and automation to avoid that building it on a dev's machine so that the quality of the packages that are passed to um, IT or better still, the, the quality of the packages that are deployed through an automated process in conjunction with IT um, are much higher quality than, than, than they were before. And the, the, the two sides of that coin, if you like, we talk about shift left and shift right. So shift left is all about putting in the automated processes, building our CI, CD pipelines, and shift right is all about putting in better telemetry and getting a continuous stream of data out that can really improve how we're writing our code and, and, and finding and fixing faults. And one of the key reasons that DevOps is becoming more and more prevalent is because it's it's a key enabler for if you're using cloud tech technologies. Um, to an extent, I'd even go so far as you can't really do cloud without DevOps. The, the nature particularly of platform as a service cloud technologies. So those where we abstract away the infrastructure so we, we don't really need to think about it and we can deploy much more quickly, we can deploy more frequently, but also we need to be much more aware of what those services are doing as they can scale elastically because frankly there's money involved if I've suddenly got 250 instances of my web app running because I've got some weird memory leak or CPU um, issue that causes it to, to perform badly and therefore the cloud throws more copies of it out. So um, over the past, I think, 12 months, 18 months, Richard and I have seen an acceleration in the engagements that we're doing. And all of those really are driven by um, customers looking more and more at Azure. And I guess this slide says it all, really. The, 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 the idea fundamentally of DevOps is it's not focused on any one technology. It's not focused on any one vendor. Um, and healthy pragmatism and, 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 and heterogeneity are, are, are key terms that you've got to think about when you're looking at DevOps. We do lots of engagements where, yes, the customer is using Microsoft everything, but we do just as many engagements where, um, to an extent, they're doing Microsoft nothing. Um, they might be using Azure to host their services, but those services might be written in Node. They might be um, built using Jenkins, deployed using Octopus, um, and uh, their, their source code repository might be, be GitHub or Bitbucket. The, the fundamentals, though, are exactly the same. Put in place automation to improve the speed and quality of delivery and allow us to get our services into the cloud better and more reliably. When you look at um, DevOps, if you if you read um, some of the books about that, particularly the ones that have been written by, by Gene Kim, if you, if you start with the Phoenix Project, which is um, an interesting little story to try and get you into the concepts, um, old fogies like me find it quite interesting because um, I did a, a, a management degree with, with quite a high proportion of productions management, total quality management in there. And 
a lot of the stuff I learned was about optimizing production lines, looking at manufacturing systems and, and um, how many grommets a given machine could stamp out in an hour and making sure that we tried to streamline our process so we didn't get um, stacks of stock building up um, outside a particular machine, things like queuing theory. And um, in the Phoenix project, what 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 Gene talks about is three ways towards DevOps. And the first way is that systems thinking, that you look at your development process and your software engineering process from um, cutting code through building to deployment and installation and management. And you, you try and identify where the bottlenecks are. And you engineer your process so that you are not, you're deliberately not um, generating a huge pile of work in one part of that process. You sort of proceed to the, the, the path of the slowest, if you like, and try and in, eliminate bottlenecks. If there's only one guy who needs a, who knows a particular technology, you've either got to work at his pace or get more guys. But you've really got to look at your, um, your pipeline, your engineering processes, and, and the things that happen within that in order to identify those bottlenecks. The second step, the second way, is introducing feedback loops. So it's really all about communication on one level. So getting the, the, the ops guys to talk to the dev guys and vice versa to say, well, you know, this, this installation script you dev guys have written has got some issues because of this, and here I can help you improve that. And the dev guys going, well, you're not really giving us enough information when you report a crash. Can you, uh, can you run these scripts or can you do this to give us more information? Um, but it's it's also about putting in place some of those extra tooling and, and systems I was talking about earlier to generate some more of that um, information to, to allow communication between the two sides. And then the third way is experimentation. And this is what we see our customers being able to do after we've engaged with them. So if you can repeatedly and reliably deploy your product because everything is scripted and automated, it makes it a lot easier to tinker with the edges, if you like, to, to say, well, um, can we do a short project that's going to try and integrate this new technology? Because you don't have to do quite so much engineering work to support that project. To give you a real-world example of that, we did some work with a customer where their developers had a problem that it took them four months to get a new test environment from IT because of the complexity of the, the, the solution and because of the other pressures on IT. Um, Richard and myself and, and a couple of our colleagues built Azure resource templates to deploy that environment into the cloud. And we could deploy that environment in an hour. And what that meant was that the capability now that the dev team had to throw up new environments and, and was was so much greater that they could start to reactivate old projects where previously it said you know that the amount of effort that the dev guys are going to put into this project the amount of return we're going to see is not worth it because by the time the IT guys have given us the environment um, that'll add either too much cost to the project or it'll be too late for us to do it so it really did enable a, a, a whole new world of, of agility and opportunity for them that they could start swapping in different technologies into their, their, their project. They could start using different techniques to deploy things or um, really sort of experiment and, 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 and make a better product because they could do that. Now, Richard has been doing ALM consultancy for quite a long time. So the, in, the, in the, the development only space, if you like, we've had application lifecycle management as a, for, as a term for, for a long time. And a lot of the stuff that we're talking about today and we're going to show you isn't new to DevOps. Application lifecycle management has been talking about doing automated build for quite a long time. It's been talking about doing automated testing for quite a long time. What's new really with DevOps, if you like, is getting the devs to talk to people outside the dev teams, increasing that level of communication, and really trying to break it down so there aren't multiple teams. The development and ops are one happy family. 
Um, and the ops guys bring the devs chocolates and that kind of stuff to keep their sugar levels up. And occasionally the devs try to talk to the ops guys, you know, that, that kind of thing. And then we start talking about tooling. And we start talking about these um, this, con this converge life cycle where we've got a set of tasks that we do. And um, these tasks pretty much are the same as we've been talking about in, in ALM for quite a long time. It's, it's talking about a continuous cycle of um, planning our product, getting our requirements, managing that, um, estimating and developing in short iterations, deploying what we've built, monitoring both our development process and the quality of our of our development and also our release process and our applications in production and the quality of those and continually trying to improve all of the elements of our um, both software operation and development operation if you like and there's a whole bunch of tooling that we can use to to do that and a lot of these are are, are available either through vsts or the, or the microsoft um products. So we've got things like application insights that you can use to get some really great telemetry out of your app. We've got hockey app if you want to try and uh, if you, you want to manage your um, beta releases and deployment of your, your mobile app out to your customers. We've got technologies for release like containers with, with Docker um, and at a, at a larger scale the Azure Container Service. When we start talking about build, we've obviously got VSTS build and, and, and release, but we've got lots and lots of other um, tools and technologies in there as well. And when we start talking about how we manage our dev teams, then we've got many, many different kinds of dashboards um, and task boards and um, ways of showing what work we've got in our current iteration or scrum, or we might have a Kanban board to show what work is waiting to be done and what work is, is where in our process. And a lot of these have, have been developed over time, not just in um, the field of software engineering, but also in the fields of you know, manufacturing and, and other consultancy, and have just been folded in and adopted to make all our lives easier. And this is the slide that I, I always like. Um, Microsoft did some, some research, commissioned some research, asking organizations whether they were doing DevOps, if you like. Whereas Donovan Brown says, sprinkle a little DevOps on it. Um, and the answers that you get back when you talk to organizations about DevOps and about IT and, and process management are many and varied. Um, but I think there are lots and lots of organizations that really fall into that first camp. But there's lots of little pockets of automation, but not really necessarily any, any great joined up thinking. Um, not that many people uh, are in the position of genuinely using DevOps practices in anger, if you like. Um, and bluntly, that's where we come in to help those customers um, identify their issues and put in place tooling and practices to improve things. So with that, because I'm, I'm conscious that I need to end at half time for, for Richard, Let's start with um, infrastructure as code and Azure resource templates as an example of that. Um, infrastructure as code is a real key component if you're going to do DevOps. You need to be able to, to deploy the environments that host your code reliably and repeatedly. And there's a real push now with technologies like ARM templates and, and desired state configuration, which is the Windows Server analog for configuring your, your servers, where we take a declarative approach that says, this is what we want our end result to be. And bluntly, I don't care what kind of dark magic is used to deploy that. Um, what that means is that the development team can um, focus on articulating what environment is required to host their application. The ops team can focus on the automation which will generate that configuration. And uh, we simply need a, a, a way of, um, a, a version controlled way of defining those environments and configuration settings that we need. So, Azure uses these things called um, resource manager templates, and they are declarative blocks of JSON 
which say what end state you want for your resources. So you might have a template that says, I want a virtual network and it's going to be this address range and I want three subnets on it and I want two servers on it and they're this big. And one's called George and one's called Mildred and, and, and um, this one's going to be a web server and this one's going to be... And the key thing about them is they're what we call idempotent. And that means that I can take a, a, a single template and throw it repeatedly at the Azure um, resource manager service, and it will reapply that template non-destructively. And every time I apply it, I will end up with exactly the same end result. And what it will do is it will look at the configuration of my services. It won't bother redeploying them if they're already there, but it will compare their current config to my declared end goal config and change it if it needs to. One of the, the great things about resource templates is that you can call other templates and I'd, I'd suggest that's a really great way of doing templates if, if you're looking at deploying your own cloud services as part of your projects because templates can get very, very long and very, very complicated really quickly and um, being able to call templates to do different elements of our deployment can make the whole thing a lot more human readable. And I think that's actually a really important point that it's okay generating uber fantastic, whizzy, intelligent templates that only you understand, but it's not really very helpful for your team. In the same way as you know the hero dev that writes obscure code that's really quick but unintelligible, he said looking at Richard writing obscure code that's unintelligible, um, doesn't help the team because nobody else can understand it, nobody else can debug it. You've got to think about how other people are going to be able to look at your code and work out from, from just reading the template what it's doing. The other thing that's really, really useful in um, uh, resource templates is that you define dependencies. So by default, Azure will try and create everything all at once. Uh, but if you know that you need the SQL service to be there before you create the app service, you can write dependencies in there. And that actually allows you to do some clever stuff if you get inventive, where you can actually deploy one service, then deploy another, then reconfigure the first service. Um, and it allows you to do some quite clever things if you've got complex environments. Doesn't happen very often if you're using platform as a service, so app services, Azure SQL functions, that kind of stuff. But if you're deploying infrastructure as a service into virtual networks, virtual machines, that sequencing is really, <laughs> really important. Um, and as with everything that we're going to talk about, are talking about today, they're part of a healthy, balanced DevOps diet. Just because you're using an ARM template does not mean that you're going to be stick, thin, and able to run a 1,000 miles. You've got to do the other stuff as well. I can write a beautiful ARM template, but if Richard doesn't deploy it properly, it's not really going to help us. So the key thing I want to get across about ARM templates is use Visual Studio to create and edit them. Uh, you can use Visual Studio code. It's a really great editor is Visual Studio code. But the Azure SDK tooling is really, really good to help you if you're coming at this from a standing start. Uh, the only axe I have to grind is for some reason they think that a, uh, an Azure resource template written in JSON is actually a C-sharp project. So as you can see from the left-hand screen there, if you do new project, work your way down through Visual C-sharp into cloud, you'll find that there's an Azure resource group template type, uh, project type. And that will create you um, a new Visual Studio solution with a project in it um, with some supporting tooling and deployment scripts that the Azure team have worked on to help you get your services out there. And when you choose that new project, the first thing you'll see is the screen on the right. And what happens is Visual Studio goes and talks to the Azure Fabric and says, hey, Mr. Azure Fabric, I need a new template project. Have you got any good start for 10 examples? And you can as I've picked in that screenshot there, start with an absolutely blank template. But what's really helpful is there are some good best practice templates to get you going on certain scenarios. So if you know you're doing a web app and SQL, you can pick that from the list and it'll scaffold in that template for you. And bluntly, you can't do that in anything but Visual Studio, which is why you should use Visual Studio. 
So I've already mentioned the JSON format. Um, that's a quick screenshot of my Visual Studio solution. I've got two JSON files in there. I have my template, and I have my template parameters.json file. So my template declares what I want to do. And um, as I'll show you in a second, one of the things I need to specify are inputs into that template, the things that I might want to be deployment specific. What name do I want to give something, or how big is something? And I can, if I want, put the answers to those questions in a parameters file. With my building good DevOps release pipelines hat on, I would say, do not use a parameters JSON file. Um, and I'll come back to that in a minute when I talk about parameters. So that's what a, uh, a template looks like. Um, as I said, it's, it's, it's all JSON. Um, but as you can see there, I've got um, the, the text in red on the, the right-hand side of, of, of the template. I've got various functions that are going on in there to, to help me uh, with my writing of it. The other reason that uh, you should use Visual Studio to manage the templates is that the tooling they give you understands the JSON in the context of Azure and shows you a really nice navigation pane down the left-hand side. So you can move around the template, see the different sections of it, and add and remove items to it with um, a little bit of pointy-clicky wizardry, rather than having to go constantly up and down the, the text-only code of a five or 600 line template, because that way madness lies. So I said there were four sections in the template. Resources are the services we're creating, and the schemas for those are all on the Azure documentation site. If you look on docs.microsoft.com, have a look inside the Azure documentation. They've spent a whole heap of time in, in recent months really trying to improve the level of documentation and put a lot of good schema documentation and some solid examples of how you deploy each kind of resource. And effectively, it's... it's um, name value pairs with properties. So I have a resource, I want to call it something. It has a type. Um, and uh, that effectively is telling the control fabric of Azure which service provider to ask to create that resource. Um, so for example, um, virtual servers are all done by Microsoft.compute. Um, this Microsoft.web is uh, an app services hosting plan. And in the properties section for my resource, I can give it information that's specific to that resource. So um, in here, you can see that I've got SKU and worker size. So that's what, um, what hosting plan billing option do I, do I want? Do I want basic? Do I want standard? Do I, do I want free? Um, and how big is the individual worker in that? Is it a couple of cores? Is it four cores? That kind of thing. Parameters allow us to pass information into that template that's specific to the deployment. And this is really important because what we want to do in our DevOps world is use exactly the same template unchanged to deploy our development environment, our test environment, and our production environment. And the only things that should be different are those parameters that we feed in. And those parameters will define whether my developer gets a single core virtual machine, my test environment might be two core, my production might be four core, um, or maybe we deploy um, dev test to the UK and production to the States, that kind of stuff. The key thing is the nitty gritty of the template doesn't change. And as Richard will show you, he can feed those values in when he calls the template to do the deployment. My recommendation to you is to try and have a relatively small number of parameters so that the whole thing is quite manageable. Um, and then you can use those with variables. And the great thing about both parameters and variables is you can actually feed in object structures. And um, particularly in variables, I find object structures really, really helpful to keep things tidy. Within those variables and within our resources section, we can do some, uh, we get some template functions. So we can do string concatenation, we can do two upper, two up, to, to lower. Um, we can even do some basic maths if we want to. But one important thing I want to call out on this screen is you'll see that it says unique string there, brackets resource group ID. Um, one of the things that we need when we're deploying stuff is to be able to generate globally unique names for some of our resources. But we can't just use a random number or random string because, I said before, this has to be idempotent. I have to deploy the template repeatedly and get the same result. 
So I always need the same unique string given a, a, a given deployment. So what that function does is based on, an, on a, a, an input, and we use resource group ID for that as a basically a global convention now across those of us doing template work. Resource group ID has to be the Azure Fabric will ensure that is a globally unique number. And the unique string function will generate a consistent unique string from that. So I know that I can have a whole bunch of resources deployed by my template and I won't get any failures because there's a namespace clash. And at the end of the day, because we're doing all of this with automated tooling, it doesn't matter if my underlying website hosting plan is called app plan followed by a 20 alphanumeric character, largely unintelligible name. I'm never going to type that in. Some other computer is going to type that in as we pass it around via a parameter. And then finally, we've got outputs. And these are really important because it's, it's okay saying, well, I'm going to create this resource. But some things are defined and created as the resource is, is deployed into Azure. So I don't know what the actual host name of a website is going to be until it's created it. I don't know what my public IP address is until I've been given it. And outputs allow me to take, as you can see there, a reference to a property of a resource and pass it back out of my template to the thing that called me. Um, and it goes, it gets handed back out as an object. And when Richard creates his release pipeline, he can take the results of that and feed it into the next stage of the release pipeline. Or if I call my template with a PowerShell script, I can feed it into the next stage of the PowerShell script. And then last but not least, um, yes, starting from scratch is, is great, but a lot of developers not unreasonably say, well, can I, can I prototype my application? Can I go into the Azure portal? Can I deploy services and build what I want and then turn that into a template? Um, and the answer to that is yes, you can. If you go into the resource group that you've created to hold all of your services and look at automation script in the, the, the left-hand column of options, it will generate for you an Azure resource template. And you can save that or copy and paste into your Visual Studio template. The thing I want to warn you about with doing that, though, if you look at that screenshot, you'll see I have no variables and I have 12 parameters. Um, I was looking with a customer yesterday where we got something like 50 parameters. And the moral of that story is you cannot just take the template that, that the Azure portal gives you and use it because it fails that human readable, understandable test that I was um, talking about earlier on. You absolutely need to do some work to move some of those parameters into a variable block to try and reduce the number of questions you're asking people when you deploy. Okay, with that, I'm going to hand over to Richard who I think is going to switch mostly to demos for this one. And I've just realized I haven't opened Edge for you. I'm just going to use Edge. Uh, right. Or Chrome or other browsers. OK. So, uh, yeah, we do have some slides here, but it's probably as easy to demo this. So the first thing I'm going to show is the application that we're actually working on. So we have an application that some of you may have come across before that's called Fabricam Fiber. It was a common Microsoft demo of a few years ago. Uh, and it's a fairly standard sort of thing. We've got a web site and behind it, a database. We don't need to worry too much about that at all. Uh, we also have a whole pile of automated tests. I will touch on those before we start because I've divided the tests into a variety of groups. Firstly, we've got true unit tests. So these are tests that can be run in memory without underlying databases. They should just work. So I can run them locally. I also have tests that require that my app has been deployed, which I've called the integration tests. So these tests will only work if the website's been deployed, a database exists, You've got some data in it, and it makes assumptions about those sorts of things. So those are tests that we can't run as part of an automated build, because the automated build is done when, before the thing's deployed. 
but we can run later. And then finally, we have two flavors of the same thing, which are tests that test the user interface. We have Microsoft's coded UI way of writing tests, and we also have some written with Selenium. If you're going to be doing any testing in this space, use Selenium. Uh, coded UI for websites, Microsoft now recommend that you use Selenium. If you're developing for apps, you look at Appium, which is the equivalent. But you can see here, we have relatively English language-like tests that we can run. But these tests, again, can only be run if the app's been deployed. So the first thing I want to do is make sure that me as a developer are just as productive as ever. So I want to be able to hit F5 or just load in a browser on a machine, and it should fire up and it should fire up a local database, and it has. It's, so it's fired up our application, and there's just a couple of things I want, and I can work on it locally and do all the things I'd expect. I can click around and go back to the dashboard, and I can do stuff, and I could debug and all of those sorts of things, because it's running locally on a SQL box on my machine with sample data. A couple of things I want to draw your attention to. One is here, it's saying it's on the dev machine. Now, all I've done there is inside my web config of my app, I'll come back to that in a second, uh, my web config, I've just set a variable that says dev PC. And I've done that because I want to show that you can change things in config files as we're doing a deployment. The other thing which I think is important is to notice down the bottom, my version number is 1.000. That's because that's what's in the assembly info file. Uh, irrespective of the language platform that you're using, you probably don't want to be setting version numbers on dev machines. What happens if you've got multiple devs working at the same time? Who increments the version number? What we want to do is inject that version number as we are deploying our application. So let's have a quick look at the app as to how we've been doing that. So the first one was, we in our web config, we have our location set, and it's hard-coded. So we'll need to replace that value when we actually deploy it. And the other thing is the version number is lurking up in the assembly info file, but all languages have similar things. Again, we'll need to replace those version numbers as we're doing a deployment. So to sort of help us in that space, we're actually going to deploy our website using a thing called uh, MS Deploy. And this is a common theme that you want your automated build to build your product and package it up so it can be deployed. So you can actually do that from Visual Studio. So we have the option to set up Publish, and it picks up that we already have a package that's been created, and we can set some variables in it. and. Uh, configure things. Uh, the key point here is I could just hit publish and it would publish it straight from my dev machine. But that's not what you want to, do, to encourage in a DevOps environment. What we actually want to do is make sure that we publish through a known reliable pipeline where everything's being checked. So the thing I've done here is I have set variables so I can easily replace these values when I actually deploy the application. There's a few in here, but we have to play with a few more little tricks to get it to work further. And I have an extra file called parameters.xml, which allows me to set things like my DB connection strings and that location value and whether I want to use test data. And all these are doing is these are parameterized settings so it, I, the deployment mechanism allows me to pass a command line parameter in and inject that value into a config file as a deploy. Because as Rick said, we want to build the product once, have a deployable package of whatever that is. In this case, it's MS deploy, but it could be an MSI file. It could be a WAR file for Java. It doesn't matter. But when we deploy it, we set all of our configuration values that would match the ARM settings that Rick's been using. Now, if I haven't got time to go into how this all works uh, with creating the parameters.xml file. But uh, if you're interested in that, just look at my blog. We've got links at the end. There's a fully worked example. The bottom line is that it's going to run that publish. So if we go into... There we are, thank you. 
what I want to now do is isn't it? Yeah. Yeah. we're going to do all of our work with uh, VSTS Microsoft's uh, ALM DevOps solution now I'm assuming as MSPs you're all fully aware of this and all active users, I don't know for definite, but even if you're not, you can go and sign up for free. Uh, you and four of your closest friends all get uh, full access to it, can use all of these services free of charge. Uh, as MSPs, you're sure you have other benefits as well in there around copies of Visual Studio and the like. But for Community use, you can download Visual Studio Community and have a five user instance of VSTS. So I have a environment set up here, well, a project. And in this project, I've got all of the code for our work. So I have a Git repo called FabricMM, which has all of Rick's ARM templates in. So all the stuff he was just talking about, it's all in here. I also have another environment called Fabricam, which has all of the code I've been working on. And what we want to do is have an automated build for that. So if I go into the build and release section and go and have a look at Fabricam Master, well, the first thing I'm actually going to do, just for the purposes of the demo, is I'm going to trigger a new build of this. Because it does take, all of the stuff we're talking about does take a few minutes, so I'll let that run in the background while we're off. But let's go and actually have a look to see what the Fabricam master build does. The summary is, it takes the source code, it compiles it and it packages it. So what are the steps to do that? First, we get the source code. And as you can see, we can get it from VSTS, but equally we could get it from GitHub, any other Git repo you can think of, or Subversion. Because it's a .NET solution, we then do a new get restore to make sure we have all of our uh, uh, packages that we require. Then we have a task that goes and versions the assemblies. And what this task does is it goes and looks for all of the assembly info files that we've got, and it injects a version number. So where's that version number come from? If we go and look on options, we can... Ooh, new UI, where have they hidden it? There we are, thank you. Uh, we have decided what our version number format is. So the, the way we do version numbers here is we set a major and a minor version as fixed variables. In our case, 1 and 7, 1 1.7. We then build the third block based on the day of the year. So we take, in this case, 1, 7 and whatever today of the year is. We would have been able to see that's going to be something like 17... 080, I think at the moment, about the 80th day of the year. And then we have a revision number. That's the build on the day. So what that means is every time we build the product, it gets a unique version number and that is stamped in. Now, this can cause some problems for some organizations where they go, we are building 1.3 of our product and they are going to ship 1.3. We don't look at it that way. We look at we're going to have a major and a minor version. Maybe we're going to ship 1.3, but we don't know what the third field or the fourth field are going to be of the version we eventually slip. We will just keep building the product until it reaches our quality standard and will be shipped. If I just go back to my... gone too far. If I go back to and edit that profile again... So that sets my version number there. I then just run Visual Studio to build the product. So this is a standard build task to build it. The only thing I've done weird or wonderful is to pass in the parameters to tell it to use that published profile that I previously created. That builds the files. I also do some more versioning of some other, those are database files. And as soon as you get into these DevOps questions, how you manage the state and structure of your databases becomes a big question. And that's a session all on its own. But it's an example here that some things you set the version number before you build them. Other things you build them and then stamp a version number onto them. We've got both options. I then set to uh, run my tests. So what I do here is... I run my test and I pass in a name-based filter 
Uh, so I only run the tests that are called unit tests. So these are the ones that can be run in memory because they're mocked. Uh, or they don't make calls to underlying systems. Then my last three commands just copy the files I'm interested in into a uh, drops location. One thing I would say there, we always make a bit of an effort when we're copying the files round to make sure we only copy the files we want. Dependent on what you're building and what languages are involved, you can often get a lot of temporary files and things you don't want. So we only copy the MSIs, the MS deploy packages, just the things we want, which is quite a long list for this project, but we didn't just go copy everything because we'll easily uh, just give ourselves a directory full of stuff and we can't exactly find what we want. Now, if these things don't do what you want, we can add more tasks to this build process. So visual, VSTS has a whole range of tasks built in. We've got a search engine now, but you've got ones that are related to doing build. So it'll build Grunt, Gulp, Gradle, Maven. And so it doesn't matter what you're trying to build, you should be able to build with it without a problem. If for any reason what you want to do isn't available as one of those tasks, you could run a batch file. So as long as you can express what you want to do from the command line, you could run it as a batch file a DOS command prompt style, uh, PowerShell, or as a bash shell script, because this build engine is cross-platform. You just tell it, do, does it need to run on Windows or does it run, need to run on a Mac or Linux? If we look back in the build section, we'll see ones down the bottom for building Xamarin code. So you can build cross-platform onto a Mac. So there's loads of options. There's also ones that are for testing, ones for packaging, ones for deploying. Now, if you can't find what you want, go and look in the marketplace. There's a fair chance there's an extension that does the work. So if I just search for my name, these are the extensions I've written. These are all PowerShell-based build extensions. They're all free of charge. And there's a whole raft of those out there that uh, do all of these various tasks that you may want. So one of the tasks we were using in our process was from this set from Collins ALM Corner. So the whole raft of tasks. And again, you can write your own. So the normal thing is you try and use the tasks that are already in there. If they're not there, you write a little utility command line. And if you think you're going to reuse it repeatedly between a lot of build processes, it's worth converting it into a task in either PowerShell or Node, picking the language dependent upon the platforms that you wish to support. So while we were talking, I believe the build has finished. So the build has gone off. And as we can see, that build has run. And we can see all of the steps that got run. We can look at the detailed logging on all of them if we wish to. We can actually turn the logging up to a higher level. This is set to a relatively low level of logging at the moment. If we then just look at its summary again, we can see it told us that eight tests ran. Uh, it told us how fast they ran. I have detailed test reports. I can see what percentage is my code coverage. I can. It would also if I done a check in because this build is automatically triggered whenever somebody checks in to the source code repository, it would associate it with their commit IDs and any work items that associated stuff with. So you get full traceability of what's going on. And we can see it actually produced for us all of those files that we needed. And the most important one in this case is the publish settings. And that zip file is all of my website. And that set parameters file are all the parameter tokens that I wish to inject values into. So that's built our product and I could now pick up this product and go so and do something with it. And we have an equivalent build for Rick's ARM template. So I now have a version stamped build of my product and a version stamped build of my ARM template. I'd now like to deploy those. And this is where we use the release functionality of VSTS. So if I go and pick my release, and have a look at the process. First thing you should notice is this looks quite similar to the build process because it's exactly the same style of agents. It has a slightly older version of UI, but we still have a long list of tasks and these are the same list of tasks. 
So if I click in here, it's the same list of tasks that you can pick from. So there's no reason why you couldn't do deploy stuff in your build and build stuff in your deploy. It's probably not a good architecture to work with, but there's no fundamental difference uh, in the tasks that are run. The difference that you do have is that we define stages or environments. So I have defined an environment called integration here and one called QA. Now the integration environment is set up such that it's automatically run. Nobody has to approve to go to it. These are all the values that need to be injected into the config files and Rick's ARM template. And it's set to automatically trigger whenever the release is triggered. And we've actually set it over here so that it triggers every time Fabricam Fiber gets rebuilt. My QA environment is set that it can only be deployed if it's been approved by one of these four people and it has a different set of variables but it can only be deployed if we've successfully gone through the integration environment so what we're doing is we're we're forcing a process into our system. It's now impossible for somebody to ship to the QA stage unless it has successfully passed through the integration stage. So what happens at each stage? Well, in integration, the first thing we do is we run a task that uses Rick's ARM template. So we say, the task says, which Azure subscription are you going to use? And they're centrally managed. So users don't need to know the keys and the tokens and the passwords. It's going to create a new Azure resource group. We point it at Rick's uh, environment, JSON file, and we could pass it a template file, as Rick said, but we don't think that's good practice. So we actually inject all of the variables that we need on the command line. So we don't store secrets in source control, we inject them all in here. And what that means is, if we go and look at variables, we can see all the variables for the integration lab and all the ones for the QA lab. They're quite similar, but there are a few differences here. And notice we can also store secrets in here. So we can, that password, once it's been typed in, you can't recover it back via the UI, you can't look it up. So uh, that means an IT manager could inject a password in there and somebody actually running the template can't actually see it. So we've set all the parameters here and what this is going to do is it's going to go off and build our Azure environment based on Rick's template. Uh, I do a little bit of stuff with a database there we don't need to worry about but then the interesting one is I run a task that writes these variables that we just looked at into the web config file, or in this case, the set parameters file, which drives the web config file. And what it does is it looks for anything that's in the form underscore, underscore, name, underscore, underscore, and replaces it with a variable of the same name. So we've got a really easy generic way of swapping values in. It means that if we add an extra parameter to the web config, I don't have to come and modify this task. It just automatically picks up the variables. I then have a few options as to how I'd like to deploy it. MS Deploy, when it generates the file, always generates you a batch file to do the work. And I could run that batch file, passing in a few parameters so it knew how to deploy it. Could do that, but it's actually easier to use a standard task that's been written by Microsoft that does the job for me. I tell it the Azure subscription, I point it at the folder, and I tell it to go. And the only extra parameter I have to do is just tell it that there is a set parameters file to use and that will go and deploy my website. I then use the same trick of updating my set parameters file to update a config file for my integration tests. And all I'm doing here is injecting the IP address that was passed out of Rick's ARM template to say, this is the address of the web server because my tests were written to work locally on my machine. But I did make sure that I could parameterize and pass that in. I then run my integration tests. I then do the same. I set my 
N U URL for my Selenium test and I run my Selenium tests. Now, if all of these tasks have worked, you might have noticed down here, by default, tasks stop if there's an error. So if I get to this last step, it means the environment built, it deployed, integration tests passed without error, Selenium tests passed without error. So I might as well throw away that Azure environment now. It's done its job. So that means I'm provisioning up an environment that's going to live for maybe 10 minutes, dependent upon what you're doing. That really cuts down on costs. I can build a brand new clean environment in a few minutes. Now, we often find a lot of the systems we work on that the environment's taken out. You do on every build, you might do it every day, but we clean down at the end. So we're not spending money on Azure time when we don't need to. The second point one is, when I do my release to QA, it's basically the same. I've just cut out all of the test steps because I have chosen not to uh, run automated tests in QA because in my head, I am deploying this environment for a human tester to have a look at. And you can see I can bolt in other things. So I use one of my tasks that goes and ups the version number. So if I've ever managed to ship my product, it goes back into... VSTS and make sure I will never build 1.7 of my product ever again. It will build 1.8. So if I now go and have a quick look on here, we should be able to see there is my release. It's fired off the release. It's telling us that it's using the Fabricam version that we just built. It's using the environment build that's probably from ages ago because we probably never touched it. And we can see that it is happy that it has deployed to the integration labs. And if I go and click on that, I can see the detail. And I've just clicked in the wrong place, haven't I? So if I look in here, there we are, and go and look at logs, I can see all the steps that happened. If I go and look on tests, I can actually see all of the tests that passed. So it ran my integration, it ran my Selenium tests. And now what I need to do, it's telling me, you need to approve this to go into production. So I come in and say, I'm going to approve this and go, this is OK. Caps locks on. And I'll approve that. And the, me, the act of me approving it, and you can have it set that multiple people have to approve it, uh, it will now go off and trigger and run into the QA environment. And it, well, I know we're very close to the end on time now, but that will eventually go out and deploy and that will be a permanent version that's up and it will be the 1.8 version of our product. So, leaping on through slides, we don't need because we've just discovered, discussed it all. So, the sort of the summary, everything we've shown you here is detailed either in our Git repos or our uh, blogs and both of our blogs are up on the blog so there's articles on all sorts of things you'll also find a whole pile of videos we've done at various places uh, on some of these technologies and on others but as i say our blogs sort of link to most of those any code samples you'll find on github and you'll also find um, uh, any extensions i've written with that thank you for listening and if anybody wants to unmute and ask questions or chat away, please don't hesitate.